Get ready to rumble. Chilling Show Unleashed on the Seven Thunders Media Network. Former city councilor, husband, father, and community watchdog. Your host, Rob Schilling. Welcome to the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. Remember, your direct support makes our show possible, and you can directly support this podcast by visiting shillingshow.com and then clicking on the Patreon banner at the top of the page to make a monthly contribution. We appreciate your support. The Shilling Show Unleashed podcast welcomes Joy Pullman, executive editor at The Federalist, author of the new book, False Flag, Why Queer Politics Mean the End of America, and Joy Pullman, thank you for joining us today on the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. Well, thank you for having me. First of all, I want to laud you on the honesty of this book. I have read a lot of books on the topic and I've never seen someone take such a direct approach and using direct well, language. <laughs> and I want to ask you about uh, just first of all, your approach to the subject, which is so honest. How did you decide to do that? Well, I mean, I would say that is a very, you know, fit for my personality. People who've been reading me at The Federalist for a while know that directness is pretty much one of my hallmarks. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I also, I mean, so in, as a part of my job, I've been, you know, reporting up for almost 20 years now. When I look at the things that happen at Pride events, I mean, I'm just looking into one in a very small local town in Ohio right now. You know, we're seeing pictures of people uh, wagging naked rear ends. Um, and they're claiming child friendly. Um, you know, they're dressing as literal demons. They're making really grotesque sex jokes on their public Facebook pages. You know, so when you see that and then, you know, contrast that with the claims from the media, you know, that all this pride stuff is just about love and kindness, you know, that there is a real disconnect between the reality and the marketing about it. So and I'm a mom. I have young children. I have absolutely zero tolerance, you know, for people waggling their private parts um, at children in public places or actually anywhere at all. You know, I just can't be quiet about that and pretend nicey nice and accept the narrative because it's completely false. So you make such a good point, and I I applaud you for standing up for your own children like that and for society. But I guess the question that comes to mind is, why is it that so many moms and dads are willing to accept this and maybe in many cases embrace it in today's America? What happened to us? Well, I think, you know, many people are quite frankly just guilted into it. You know, we're told we can't oppose people waggling naked bits at children because that would be unloving. You know, so there's this mass manipulation campaign, and I talk about this in the book, you know, quite a bit, that really it's, it's manipulating and coercing people into denying the evidence before their very eyes that, you know, all of us know it should be deep down inside if it's not right at the forefront of our minds, you know, that talking about sexual matters with other people's children, let alone showing them pictures of it and funding that with public libraries and other things, it, is, it should be obvious to anyone that that's completely unacceptable behavior that is, you know, uh, just it's wrong. It's wrong to do that to children. But I think it's not just, you know, moms and dads. Of course, it's moms and dads, but also there's many, you know, in the queer community. They're not comfortable with that. They know that it's wrong. And they are frankly shut up because of all of this, you know, claims about you. You know, we're we're told that we're a bigot. In America, that being a bigot is the worst possible thing you can be. You know, puts you in a group with the KKK, with the Nazis, all of the evil, 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 horrible people, you know, in, in recent history. Um, You know, so nobody, of course, wants to be a Nazi or a bigot. So we just shut up and and we pretend that we don't really know what we actually know. And we are, you know, victim to these very well-funded silencing and coercion campaigns. And I I will say, you know, it's not just big corporate. It's it's even in in small towns. You know, I I know stories, you know, people who are hit with gag orders, threatened with lawsuits, hundred thousand dollar lawsuits just for saying we don't want naked parades um, in, in our little towns. So there's a very well-funded, you know, the people who are on the side of destroying our public square and making it hostile to families and children, they have a lot of money, they have a lot of power, and they are using it to intimidate average people. You mentioned in the book early on, Joy, the explosion of the rainbow in the 2010s and 2020s, which which is Uh just, I mean, we can't get away from it. But this didn't just come out of nowhere. Tell us how this came about. Well, I actually, in my book, trace, I guess, most directly to the 1960s, but also, of course, the kind of craziness of the 1960s has its antecedents in the earlier progressive movement um, in the 1920s. 
But I'm, I'm not going to go through all of that. If people kind of want the history to see all the details, you know, they, that's what the book is for. I'll just give the quick and dirty for the listeners um, right now. So the short of it is, you know, the American society really made a fundamental transformation with the progressive administrations of Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt. Of course, they didn't have any overt ties to sexuality then, but what those administrations did really was the society you know, of Americans went, underwent a sea change and became influenced by communists at that time to erase our standards of commitment to natural law, which the U.S. Constitution is based on, and switch over to a living constitution, which basically replaces the historic arrangement that Americans have between our government where, you know, we have our rights inherently from God and the government merely recognizes them. And it's, it's a job of the government to secure and protect those already existing rights. No one can take away. That's why they call it inalienable. And we slowly switch to a system of government where instead the government controls what quote unquote rights you have and it can dispense or erase them as you please. So we slowly shifted in this country from the individual rights to the group rights. And so what that really does is it erases, you know, your rights at all while still calling them rights while using that language. And again, you know, tricking people, this entire movement has functioned through complete deception and trickery all the way through from the beginning, tricking people that we still have rights. while really we, we don't have rights if they are only available, if the government de- deems us to be a protected class or a protected group. So the early progressives actually, and I give evidence for this in the, in the book, they are the ones, Woodrow Wilson, all the way back there said, we don't ha- believe in individual rights because they, we believe in group rights. You only get your right from the government on the basis of your identity as part of a particular protected class. That was all the way back with Woodrow Wilson. And so, I mean, I think folks nowadays, you know, we're familiar with these identity groups with these different, obviously, you know, queer folks are one of those identity groups. Racial groups are other parts of the coalition. You know, women are another splinter group, so on and so forth. So, but that idea of group identities replaced the American idea of natural rights. And so that, you know, that groundwork laid in our law and culture that early, even though it didn't have a rabidly sexual tinge to it because, you know, Americans would have immediately rejected it if it did. But that came to fruition again in the 1960s. And then today, where once you replace, you know, our individual light rights that the government secures by law with group rights, the government can take away and you only get certain rights. If you're part of a class that the government has given protected status, then you've erased essentially the American rule of law, the constitution and our way of life. I I trace all of those legal developments and how they tie into the sexual revolution. I tie it also the sexual politics into communism because, you know, the early communists, they were free love people. They, they held women in common. They abandoned their children. They engaged in homosexual behavior. They did all of the things that now, you know, openly, you know, these uh, movements are trying to encourage for everyone to do. That was an integral part of the communist movement. They call, you know, they call it eliminating property, you know, rights between women and children. They call it equality to erase marriage. So what was a fringe, radical, insane, subversive communist idea then, well, it still is now, but it's become, you know, gone from a few, co- you know, a couple of few people in German, German universities who infiltrated the U.S. to being completely mainstream now to the point, you know, I write in the book about the potential changes to marriage law, changes between parents and children, essentially shifting from the understanding, you know, that children are given to parents to be their wards and guardians until adulthood um, into you know, having the government be essentially the guardian, the legal guardian of all children based on the kind of family changes that queer activists are right at the forefront of pushing. For example, you know, with their rampant use of embryo fertilization, when you grow a baby in a test tube, with three, four different genetic parental material and a surrogate carrier, you know, you create legal arrangements that are going to affect even the families who grow the children in the natural way between, um, you know, husband and wife who are together for life for the good of those kids. So I talk, I talk about all that in the book. That's it's a deep subject. That's why there's a book about it. But that's just kind of a quick overview of the answer. Short answer. That's a short answer to a lot more going on with that question. No, it's so important to understand the history and how we got here. Something that also deals with history is the historic proof that ending sexual restraint, as you reference in the book, destroys societies. And a lot of people are just not well enough versed in history to understand the uh-huh. connection. So tell, tell us if you would maybe just an example of how that's happened in the past as we can see it happening now. I don't think this is very well known, 
but I quote a number of researchers, very well-known Cambridge, for example, Cambridge researchers, a number of other people. But I think also this is one of those things that I think people do know intuitively. It just makes sense if you are a close observer of human nature that when people have chaos in their families, it really has long-term effects, not just on them, but all of society. So we are seeing the fruit of that, you know, today because it's just under a, a, you know, nearly a majority of children grow up in homes in America without their own married biological parents. And I cite a lot of research that talks about how when that very strong sexual drive, we're all aware of how powerful that it is, if it is not driven into productive endeavors, such as creating a family, such as providing for that family, protecting for that family, if you don't have a good outlet for those energies and instead they are they're kind of left to go haywire all over the place, then essentially society disintegrates. Because if you have children who are raised, are raised in chaotic homes where they don't know, you know, if daddy will be home that night, if there is a daddy, you know, and maybe he left a long time ago, or, you know, maybe, you know, mom has a new boyfriend. That sort of behavior is very deeply destabilizing to children. There are many, many, many research links between those sorts of home environments and not only, you know, like overt child abuse, such as violence children, but also tacit child abuse, such as psychological wounds. Children like me who are from divorced and separated homes, we know that it is, you know, it's not easy. The kids are not just all right. It takes a lot of psychological work to come to terms with those wounds from, you know, from our families. And it's a very difficult thing to process. So when you multiply, you know, the basically the effects of that stray sexual voltage not being directed into families and being grounded in a healthy a healthy home environment between nuclear families supported by their extended family, and when you have atomized people who where their homes are a place of disaster and chaos rather than refuge and security, you know, then essentially your whole society falls apart. And I mean, I think a lot of people are really seeing that society falling apart thing, right? I don't know about you, but when I go out just shopping, you know, I look at people in my normal middle class American town and I think pe- they do not look very good. People are there. They don't look healthy. Um, you know, they don't look you in the eye when you talk. They, you know, there's more weird mannerisms, you know, kind of like social tics and behaviors. Um, you know, even among your friend circles, I think people notice there's more, you know, people are addicted to their phones. They're addicted to I mean, addicted to even substances, you know, ranging from light, you know, alcohol or cigarettes, you know, from to, to darker, you know, medication of all kinds. I think people have noticed a the uh, expansion of social chaos just from kind of being out in your community. Pe- social norms, different ways of behavior. Those of us who are not 20 and under, we remember just 10 years ago, remember 20 years ago when people were friendlier at the checkout line, things were cleaner. There wasn't so much trash in the streets, just all of these symptoms of things. And I I trace them in the book back to the root of many, many, I mean, you know, I don't think anything, everything, you know, can be attributed to this, but a very, very large part can be attributed to the psychic chaos of growing up in a, you know, and just separated homes, atomized homes. Even if you have a mom and a dad, you know, you might be a minority or just 50%, you're not a majority of people. And so even other people's actions, there's research that shows, you know, other people's divorces, even if your parents stay married, that does affect you. It increases the likelihood of divorce in the neighborhood. And so all of these sort of knock on effects. um, I also go in the book. So to tie back to our core topic here, um, you know, there is a very well established link between childhood trauma and queer identification. Mm-hmm. And even, you know, LGBT, you know, activists and, and foundations, they, they, you know, they will openly proclaim this, right? They will talk about the higher rates of mental illness, depression, suicidality among LGBT people. And I think all of that is absolutely real because every time I, as a reporter, you know, I'm, I'm going to write about some case with involving a transgender child, I look back, or, you know, a t- transgender person, I look back in that person's history And I can always find a trauma there, you know, whether it was uh, maybe we're present for someone to die in a car crash. They lost their mom or their dad or their parents endured a divorce. Any time if you look in the background of those people, I have always found that there's trauma involved. And I think that is real. And I think that a lot of this ideation is a cry for help. And it's a cry that unfortunately is really going unheard and unlistened to. And instead, queer people are being exploited for political agendas rather than having their true deep um, needs and their sorrows addressed in a healthy way. 
The Shilling Show Unleashed podcast continues in a moment. Our guest is Joy Pullman, and the book is False Flag. Get your fix online at shillingshow.com. Shillingshowmedia.com is your one-stop shop for websites, audio and video production, and photography. Shillingshowmedia.com will take your project from conception to completion. Shillingshowmedia.com is reasonably priced and highly professional. Need a website for your business? Visit Shillingshowmedia.com. Need a video created or edited? Visit Shillingshowmedia.com. Have a photography or graphic design project? Visit Shillingshowmedia.com. Shillingshowmedia.com is your one-stop shop for websites, audio and video production, and photography. Visit Shillingshowmedia.com. That's Shillingshowmedia.com. Looking out for us. Rob Shub. We continue now with Joy Pullman, the book, False Flag, Why Queer Politics Mean the End of America, here on the Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. So I want to get to the term pride, which is so curious in that it's a biblical contradiction. So maybe we could start there. How do they glom onto the word pride? My guess would be, you know, it's honestly a kind of defensive reaction to the shame that has long accompanied homosexual behavior. You know, and I do think there should be shame that accompanies, you know, the idea to expose yourself to children at a pride parade. I'm, I just have an article up at the Federalist today, literally showing a uh, performer at a pride parade talking about how he's glad to see the children there. There's pictures of the event. It includes, you know, people almost completely naked on floats. They're, they're behind, they're hanging out. And so we're talking about children witnessing that. That is abusive and shameful behavior. There's shame attached with that exposure and that inability to keep sexuality where it belongs in the bedroom. Some of that is healthy and some of that is unhealthy. But I think, you know, the pride sort of moniker basically is a rejection of attaching any shame to public sexual displays. And so it's kind of a defiant. And I know this, you know, this has been quoted in numerous news articles. It's basically a defiance of social convention. And I mean, again, if you look not just news articles, but academic journals, queer theorists, will say, I mean, they openly, they not only defy, quote unquote, social norms and social conventions, such as marriage and the prohibitions against exposing yourself to children, but they also defy natural law. I quote in my book from a transgender theorist named Susan Stryker, who wrote, you know, a seminal essay about, he literally calls himself a Frankenstein monster. He, he quotes the word, you know, says Frankenstein, calls himself a monster multiple times, and he openly says that he identifies as transgender and has changed his body in that way to defy God. Mm. Um, He says he hates God, he identifies with Satan, and in Satan's rebellion against God. So I have an entire chapter in this book that talks about, I mean, I think for me, you know, people don't know that, but openly, publicly leading queer theorists, academics, um, you know, people who are spokesmen for the movement say they are in rebellion against nature and nature's God, and that they consider their sexual displays to be part of that rebellion, and they are in war against God, and they are on the side of Satan. I mean, I know that sounds wild. We don't talk about Satan a lot in public, but I quote them themselves. They say they're identifying with Lucifer, symbolically as well as literally. So that's very surprising, folks who want to check out more of that. You know, it's in my book. It's documented. I've, I've got I think 2,000 footnotes in there. So you can go prove it to yourself if, you, if you're skeptical. It's, it's amazing. I think the other part of this, which is directly tied again to the Bible, is the stealing of the rainbow symbol, which was given as a promise by God never to flood the earth again. And now this has mm-hmm. been taken and appropriated by the pride movement. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. You know, so I'm, I'm a creative person, as you can know. Not only do I write books, but I have been an artist for a long time. You know, and I'm English major in college, you know, so we work with symbols and symbolism, right? So the rainbow symbol, you know, as you said, in Christian art has been a symbol of God's mercy. And I actually think, I, I mean, I, I think there can be both a good and a bad thing about that if we relate it to the queer movement, because I think there, there's probably something deep inside where, you know, queer people, by identifying with the rainbow, they actually are tacitly admitting their need for God's mercy. And God does extend that mercy to all people, no matter what they have done. You know, no matter what shame they may have, whether deserved or undeserved. And that's something I also talk about in the book, that even people who reject Christianity, the, you know, like a lot of queer people do, most of them do. You know, some of them, you know, literally are aligning with, you know, an institution called the Satanic Temple, you know, and rejecting Christianity. 
But even those who do that adopt Christian symbols and language and way of talking in the course of attempting to rebel against it. It's almost like it is true and baked into this world and can't be gotten away. Even from people who are trying to rebel, they have to use Christian symbolism and, and topics. So yes, of course, as you point out, the, the Bible says after you know the great flood of the earth to erase um, wickedness that included sexual exploitation of children and killing them ritually for, for pagan sacrifices. Um, God wiped the earth clean with a flood, but he promised never to do that again. And the rainbow was his sign of his mercy and forbearance. But, you know, of course, wise people, when God is being merciful and not bringing judgment upon horrible evils that you are doing, the wise will repent. You know, there's a lot in this book to see that Americans should be repenting for. I, I myself have thought about that a lot as an American who loves this country and looks at this evil every day. One of my prayers is, is for God's mercy and for repentance to come, because that is the real way that people find peace and hope. It's not through rebellion against him. It's not through defiance. It's through acceptance of his willingness to take away everything that troubles them. You have an interesting quote in the book. There's a section called Love Doesn't Mutilate People. And I'm thinking back just a few years, Joy, when the many on the left were outraged over uh, what they called female genital mutilation, which they should have been outraged Uh over. And yet we are essentially practicing that on a much broader scale and celebrating it. You know, I am reading right now and about to review for The Federalist a book called D-Trans. It's by a Daily Signal reporter named Mary Margaret Olihan. I just she interviewed her on this yes, book. Yes, yes. Okay, so, you're, so your audience may be familiar. Yeah. But she, you know, so she talks to young ladies. Uh, you know, she actually talks to young men, too. But, you know, her the largest interviews that she does are with transgender young women who have stopped identifying as transgender This is something about my job that I hate. You know, I've looked at those photos. In my book, I describe, for example, and I've looked at the photos to talk about this because I feel like people need to know this, need to do it, because if we don't see the evil, we will not do anything about it. We must do something about it. I've looked at those images of um, how to construct a fake, let's let's say male private part, because I always am sensitive about maybe children listening. So surgeons do that by how do I say this delicately? They strip the arm skin of someone. It's called Mm. cuffing. Mm. So you can see it looks like, um, it honestly looks like something out of a gulag, out of Nazi experiments on an arm of a young, a young woman, or they send a robot into the belly to take out, I believe in intestinal Mm. lining to create prosthetic um, item on, on the body. Mm. Miss Olhan's book talks about how the young ladies who have done this, some of them have weeping wounds for per- perhaps the rest of their lives. They're suing, you know, they're, some of them, their medical providers who did this to them. The sort of prosthetic, you know, male item does not function like a normal one does because it is not a natural body part. It never works properly. It, the people describe how painful it is. You know, there's, there's sometimes hair will grow into, you know, these open wounds on their bodies, keeping it's very painful. They have to, you know, manipulate them to keep the wounds essentially from closing onto themselves. It's it's horrible. It's horrible. It's horrible. It's horrible. The the thought that you know the United States not only allows this, but many states fund this through taxpayer dollars. It's horrifying. And so when we talk about repentance, we do have a lot of work to do to create social justice for young women and men who may be unknowingly you know subject. These young people, some of them were were um, brought into these things as young as age 14, 16, would have their in, their breasts taken off and we, now weeping fluid for perhaps the rest of their lives. These are barbaric procedures that never should happen in the United States. And we've got a lot of work to do in order to end them and and help um, people understand what is going on here, how evil it is. And and my book is part of an effort, you know, to help people understand what's going on so that we can be firm in a refusal to allow it to happen in this country. You cover this topic in your book about furries, which uh, and previous to reading your book, I thought was a strange but benign thing. Yes. But there is yes. something very dark behind the, the epidemic of furries. Would you tell us about it? I also explore how, you know, this, the identifying as something other than what you naturally are has already become, it been expanded, not just into, you know, male to female or female to male attempts at posing, you know, and medical manipulations there, but also literally into, and I'm quoting here from transgender theorists, academics, published journals, right? Not say they call it trans species. They uh, literally are. um, And so some people, and this is of course the cutting edge, but some people have bodily modified themselves to have forked tongues, 
to have scales imprinted onto their skin, to have bumps implanted under their skin, to look like lizards. Mm. Um, and I go through a number of, I mean, uh, have eyeball tattoos to darken the whites of the eyes into black or different frightening colors. And some of these people identify as different species. So I point out in my book that, you know, like you mentioned, um, sometimes people just want to dress up as the, their favorite mascot, you know, for a sports team or a cartoon character on TV, you know, and there's innocence there. And I don't, and it's, it's one of the things that frustrates me about this whole sexual identity and orientation topic is that it ruins innocence, right? Because I believe that sex can be wonderful, you know, good, um, happy, <clears throat> uh, you know, a source of joy in people's lives. Absolutely. But there's so many ways of taking that powerful good and distorting it. That often happens with, with the phrase, right? So I learned, I've learned about this. So I'm, of course, a reporter. People reach out to me when they hear stuff like this. I've, you know, I've heard folks from multiple different towns saying, like, there's a kid acting like a dog in school, and the teachers are affirming him just like, you know, if he was a transgender kid. And that is happening in some places across the country. And some people do it for innocent fun, and some people do it. Um, I mean, I, I quote in there, you know, there was a sex pedophile ring linked to a furry convention busted in Philadelphia a number of years ago, right? So it, some of it's innocent and some of it is ho horrific and the two kind of blend together there. But it's all enabled by, you know, this transgender ideology that says whatever, you know, your mind can think up and dream and fantasize about, you should be able to, you know, have surgical changes to your body to approximate even animals. I'd like to end, if we could, Joy, on the topic of strategies for counter-revolution, which you detail at the end of the book, and it's so important that people have a ray of hope. So where do we start? Well, I do think that the first place to start, people really need to be involved at the local level. You know, a very small minority of people vote even in their primary elections at the local level. You know, it's often 15 percent, maybe up to 25 percent of the registered voters will vote in a primary. First of all, that means that you can control the outcome of the primary, you know, if you just knock on doors and you have a dedicated group of small people who really want to see change. I've seen that multiple times in localities, but people need to understand that their localities are kind of like the double AA, A, triple A teams, you know, for baseball. What they are is a place where people are recruited, they get some skills, and often from that local city council, county council, you know, state representative, then they will, you know, later move up into bigger offices even all the way, you know, to senator and governor. If you don't like, you know, the way that the country is running, I, I, as a national political reporter, I can tell you it's very, very difficult and unlikely to fight the national players, you know, all the way at the top level going there straight. I would advise people to work on the local level, the farm team, and get a better farm team going for any political party <laughs> and improve our country starting there. I don't think there's just um, a role for solely politics. I don't I think that politics is downstream of culture. That's the famous Andrew Breitbart quote. And so, you know, number one, people need to be making sure that their homes are places of hope, healing, havens and restoration and that their children are happy there. Their marriages are strong. If people need to cut down on the activities, maybe cut out a sport or two, you know, or, or whatever, it's, you know, obviously up to your own discretion. But think about whether, you know, you have enough time in your lives to, you know, look your children in the eyeball and really know how they're doing and have a strong relationship. And, and you as the parent be someone they depend on, they rely on, they come to, and you would notice quickly if something was wrong with your child. You know, so I, as a mom, I've cut down my work hours in order to do that. Um, you know, our family, we don't um, participate in sports, you know, that we have more family time together. And I, you know, I think these are things people should be thinking about because um, the relationships in your family are the, they are what society is built on. And if your children do not feel that home is a secure base for them, they are more likely to be vulnerable to people who want to exploit them. So I think people start with their homes. And then if your home is in a good place, you start, go to your local community, your church, support people there. You know, it is, I, I do believe in nuclear families, but I also have one. And I know that it's a lot of work, especially when the children are young and anyone who shows up to lend a pair of helping hands is completely welcome in those times. So if you are someone who has a pair of helping hands, support a young family near you, you know, take their kids, um, you know, maybe to their activities or invite them over for dinner or offer free babysitting, be a support system to people because the more people have relationships that are solid, 
the less their isolation loneliness will drive them to despair and to look for creepy people on the internet who have lots of evil ideas about how to destroy them. These are words of wisdom. Joy Pullman, if people would like to follow your work online or get a copy of the book, False Flag, Why Queer Politics Mean the End of America, tell us how we can do those things. Well, I mean, you can just look for the book on Amazon, and I will say folks have told me it might be a little bit difficult to find. So if you search false flag in my name, um, it, it does come up there, for, you know, for me. So Joy Pullman, two ends, and then you, folks can follow the rest of my work at thefederalist.com. Um, we're, we know we're, that's where I am week in and week out, fighting the good fight. You've done an outstanding job with the book, and you continue to do so online as well. Joy Pullman, thank you for joining us today on The Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. Thank you so much for having me. That concludes another edition of The Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. Visit us online at shillingshow.com, where you can directly support this podcast by clicking on the Patreon banner at the top of the page and making a monthly donation. Your support is essential for the continuation of The Shilling Show Unleashed podcast. Until next time...